Hello everybody. Last year, my good friend George, who lives up here in beautiful Scotland, asked me for some advice. He needed a new car to get him through the winter months and wanted something economical and dependable. Naturally, I told him to go and buy an old Toyota. But as any sensible petrol head would do, he completely ignored my advice and instead bought a dirt cheap Jag. Not long after he bought the car, I did a little piece on it. However, it's now been a year since he collected it. So as I find myself once again in sunny Scotland, I thought this was as good an opportunity as any to catch up with him and see how the life of a Jaguar owner is treating him. Hello, my name's George, and this is my Jag. So my first car was a 1970 Series 2A Land Rover long wheelbase petrol. I was obsessed with Land Rovers as a kid. I don't know why I'd always liked them, and um, it was suggested that I should go halves with one with my dad and get one as my first car, which I did when I was 17. Couldn't afford it until I was 18. And when I was 18, we could finally afford the insurance and I ran around in it for a couple of years. I was at uni, not really doing mega miles in it, which was good because it was doing like 18 to the gallon. And then when I was 20 uh, and I was between my third and fourth year at Dundee University doing mechanical engineering, I got a job at a small country garage. We're kind of a bit of a specialist. They had Astons, Bentleys, things like that in, which I was really interested in, which is why I got the job there, even though it paid a complete pittance. And the first car that I worked on when I was in there was a Porsche 944 Turbo. And I was infatuated with this car. I drove it with brakes, which were pretty non-existent i think half the bleed nipples were snapped off and that was why it was in to try and basically make the brakes work on the cheap which we kind of did and i was tossed the keys and told go out and see if it's still you know behaving in itself or not and i was like oh right okay by this point about the fastest car i'd ever driven was my mum's 1.2 corsa which was a rocket ship compared to the land rover that i had and then i left the garage went past the local primary school with all the kids coming out and they all stared at me in this bright 944 Turbo and I thought, wow, this is cool. And then I put my foot down in second gear and experienced that Porsche Turbo boost from the 80s and thought, wow, I have to have one. So about a month later, I bought an eight valve basic 944 had that for quite a few years, spent loads of money on it. It was one owner, um, thought it was a good buy. It maybe kind of was, but also wasn't. And when I left uni, I decided that I needed to get a sensible car. So rather than chopping in the 944, I bought a one litre Fiesta ZTEC S, one of the EcoBoost turbo ones, and had that for a few years. That was good fun, you know, for a first car, and it was fine but I was getting a bit bored of it. My partner, Caitlin, by that time had bought the Abarth 595, which I know, James, you're an enormous fan of. And I have to say, I was feeling a bit shortchanged, even though I had the 944. So the Fiesta went, my mum and dad bought that off me, which was quite handy. And I got a 2015 F56, or F55, I should say, a Mini Cooper SD, which I thought was going to be fun, economical, well-equipped, LED headlights, blah, 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 and it was gonna be great. And it was until I realized that it was depreciating like money was going out of fashion, and it was not as reliable as I hoped it would be. And one day I sat down and worked out that in 18 months, this diesel Mini had cost me five grand to own. So around the time that I was working out that the Mini was costing all this money, the 944 by that point had already gone and I'd replaced that with the Cayman, the one that I had the issue with Admiral with. And that was a lot of fun. And I was thinking, is this Mini really worth spending over three times as much to own as this Cayman? And I thought, no, it isn't. And I was also getting sick of paying out money on higher purchase agreements, thinking that I was doing the right thing because I was gonna own the car at the end of it, 
but the car was depreciating as quickly as I was paying it off. And that made me think, well, why do I need to borrow money to own a car? And also, why do I want to own an everyday car that loses money? So that's when I came to you and said, look, what happens if I sell the Mini, take the two and a bit grand that I've got in, in capital out of that, and then just buy another car with that, not even add any more of my own money into it. And that's when you said, why don't you go out and buy a Toyota? Now, I looked at Toyotas, I looked at Camrys, that was kind of the closest thing to what I wanted. But around that time, my friend Gordon had bought a Jag. And he started off with an X308, just a plain 3.2 litre XJ8, and it was rotten, completely rotten, but it was utterly beguiling. And I drove it and thought, wow, this, I get what Jags are all about now. And not long after he had that, he had some welding and things done on it, it didn't really work. So he chopped that in and got one of these, an X350, but he got an XJR, and he loaned me that for a month. And yeah, I, I wanted one. I, I just couldn't stop thinking about Jags. Every time I was like, right, Ford, Toyota, right, we'll go on, we'll go on Auto Trader, And I'd be like scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down. Oh, Jaguar, oh. And before I knew it, I was dead set on the idea of a Jag, an XJ in particular, and one of these aluminium ones. So I started trawling, went on the Jaguar Enthusiast Club website and found this one for sale with a category N rating. 164,000 miles on the clock, one owner, 1,500 pounds. So we kind of hatched a plan where I was going to buy a one-way ticket, because of course, what could possibly go wrong with going and buying a car sight unseen for 1,500 pounds, and flew down. And we got a lift over to go and see the car, and everything seemed to be in order, and 1,500 pounds had already been exchanged, the car was already mine by the time we got there, so there was no backing out. And we left, and the first thing we did is we went and collected your 550 from Meridian Modena in it. And that was a bit of a shakedown run, and I realised that it maybe wasn't quite in as good condition as I thought. However, it was genuinely a well-looked-after 2004 XJ6 with the 3.0-litre Duratec V6 in it. Air suspension all round, heated seats front and back, not, the colour wasn't too offensive, quality of the walnut inside was really nice, and although it had issues, it was just as wafty as I hoped. Okay, because I was used to the XJR, yes, it did feel a little lethargic, but you know, it wasn't as breathless as I was worried it was going to be. And I came back to stay at your place, James, and the next morning at seven o'clock, I left and drove it back up here to Scotland. In total, from where I bought it to getting home was an 11 hour journey, which I did all on my own with about 25 minutes worth of stops on the whole trip. And it was the most comfortable trip back up from England that I've ever had. And it was the only car that I'd ever done that length of journey in and not got out with a sore back. And that made me think, you know what? I bought the right car because it's really, really good at that sort of thing. So when I got the car home, the first thing that was immediately obvious was the issue with the gearbox. Now that had kind of been obvious really from the moment that I first put it in gear because it was very, very clunky. And I thought, oh no, what have I done? I've bought a complete pup. But going on your advice, James, uh, it's quite often the way that these old automatic gearboxes, all they really need is a fluid change. So that was the first thing that I did. I also had the uh, rear differential oil changed, which is not the easiest job in these cars because you have to use the fill plug as the drain plug. So you need like a suction equipment. I didn't really have that. So I just pumped it into the garage and I got them to do it all. And when I got it back out, uh, it was driving a lot, lot better. What was also obvious was some stuff in the front suspension was worn. Uh, when you went over certain bumps, it would make a clonking noise which was fine but when you went over other bumps particularly when you were in mid corner the steering wheel would shudder in your hands and it would kind of um, track its way across the road so i also had the track rod ends and the track rod innards replaced the drop links replaced and i've worked out that it needs the steering rack bushes replaced other than that the only other issue was one which i caused myself 
the engine was very greasy, so I did my usual routine of uh, using degreaser, getting in there, gently jet washing it off, started the car, it was all running fine, parked the car up for the night, my girlfriend took the car into Dundee the next day, and it was only running on four of its six cylinders, and by the time she got it home, the amount of fuel that had been going down the exhaust, uh, combined with the exhaust gases from the one cylinder that was working on that bank, it had detonated on the inside of the catalytic converter and smashed it to pieces. So I had to get a new cat for it, which was about 400 quid, which was a little sore because I'd caused that myself. Put new spark plugs in it. They were about £2.50 a go. And I serviced it. The service for all the oil, all the filters was about £90. And I know what you're thinking. You buy an old Jag, an old barge, it's a tale as old as time itself. Man buys barge, barge goes wrong, man spends more money on barge than barge cost, and before you know it, it's a world of financial ruin. And I'm going to try not to look really smug at this point, but other than the issues that the car had when I first picked it up, nothing's gone wrong with it. It's just ticked over 175,000 very comfy miles, and I feel like a very, very smug man standing here right now. In terms of cost of running the car, fuel aside, uh, it was £1,500 to buy. The gearbox and differential service was about £400. The new catalytic converter was, again, about £400. Servicing it and putting a new coolant hose in it, things like that, was about £200. So you could say that all in, maintenance-wise, car owes me about £2,500. The other nice thing is, although it's a bigger engine, the fact it's so cheap to buy means that the insurance is also cheap and what I was paying for the Mini was about £500 a year, bearing in mind I was 25 at the time, and insuring it for 15,000 miles and I pay £300 a year to have this flagship Jaguar saloon car, which I think is really good value. So all in, I am laughing because uh, it's paid for itself within 10 months of finance payments on the Mini and it's, it's mine. It's all mine. So Jaguar, um, interesting brand, not one I'd really ever had any great interest in. I think my interest was f only peaked on PlayStation 1, on Gran Turismo and Gran Turismo 2, because they had, oh, I'm not sure if it would be the X300 or the X308, but they had the long, sleek XJR in Gran Turismo, and I thought this was cool, because it was so long and low, and I thought, wow, that's pretty and then immediately moved on and got interested in Land Rovers and didn't care one bit about Jags. Like many people, the sort of early stuff from the 60s, like um, D-types, E-types, XK120s, all that kind of stuff, I thought was cool, classic cars. But modern Jags, X-types, XFs were lethargic, dull, wafty cars for old boys. And... Then I drove Gordon's X308 V8 and realised that although it is comfy and wafty, they're a lot more lithe on the road and supple and the way that they flow down the road and carry speed is really beguiling. They just are so satisfying to drive. And also the whole kind of um, automatic gearbox with a V8, I kind of thought, why would you want an auto when you've got that nice a V8? You'd want a manual but I finally got it. And I even now get the whole appeal of the XK, even with the wood interior. It's just such a nice thing to do big distances in. So yeah, I really, um, I'm still a Porsche man at heart, but I like a Jag. Yeah, so things changed when the Cayman had to go because when I bought this, the idea was that, you know, I would always have a Cayman and if the Jag was broken, I could use the Cayman and because Caitlin and I run the Porsche Club, we'd always have the Cayman, we'd go to Porsche Club stuff in that and the Jag would just be an everyday hack and if it was broken and it had to sit off the road for a couple of weeks, I could cope with that. But then the opportunity came up to buy the house that we were in and the Cayman had to go to pay for that. 
which meant that I was now down to just the Jag. And that was never really the intention because I never expected this car to be fully reliable and I always intended to have a second car. So if this was ever broken, we could deal with that. But the Jag has been so good to me and I now have so much confidence in it that I actually don't feel the need to get another car at the moment. So this really is my only car. And it feels funny to have gone from owning cars worth 25, 30K down to owning just 1,500 quid's worth of car. But I'm not unhappy because it's comfy, but it's also fun to drive in its own way. It does have nice steering. It's not feelsome, but it's natural and it's got lovely weighting. The way it flows down the road, James, you commented on this, it's got this lovely flow. And when you get it in gear, in the J-Gate, locked in third, the engine is sweet, it's nice to rev. It's not quick, but it's fun. And you know what, for the moment, while we're building a home together, and I'm gonna try and save up for a 360 at some point, I'm quite happy with this, you know. I really think I could have spent a lot more money and not have a car that's as good and as enjoyable to own as this one is. Yeah, in terms of unexpected surprises, well, the first one's got to be the reliability. I went into this with my eyes open and I thought, if I get away with spending less than a thousand pounds a year maintaining this, I'd be happy. And you know what? Other than the initial work, it's not really costing anything other than ordinary servicing, so that has definitely been a big surprise. The other surprise with it is just how interested everyone is in it like when i had the cayman you know i thought i was cool you know i was 23 when i got that i thought i was the dog's dangly bits had this cayman people are genuinely more interested and excited by this old jag than they ever were in the cayman and the opportunities for humor that come with this jag has hands down been the best bit of the whole ownership experience the jokes about borrowing people's oil paintings about not paying for dinner about leaving my wallet at home all the time even the tweed, you know, before I had a Jag, I never owned a piece of tweed clothing. And I have two tweed jackets, not one, two tweed jackets. I'm even wearing bloody brogues. You know, I, I had a Cayman, like look, look what's happened to me. That's what a driving a Jag does to you. And that humor that goes with it is just so much fun. And I could forgive this car for a lot of faults because it, gets you in to a conversation with anyone. Everyone finds it funny. Even the people at work say, what are you doing with a Panama hat in the back of your car? I'm like, well, it's a Jag, it's a legal requirement. You've got to have one, just like you've got to have the metal tin of travel suites in the glove box. I mean, if you're stopped by the police and you don't have those, you know, I think it's up to 500 pounds that you could be fined. So that, that whole comedy aspect of it is just brilliant and it's worth it just for that. I'm now up to 11,000 miles in about 10 months in the car, which have been very pleasant miles. In terms of plans for it, I, I've kind of been thinking about that because on the one hand, you know, like any car enthusiast, you, you want to improve it, you know, and you want to make it better and nicer. And you think about, you know, oh, you know, maybe preemptively change some of this stuff and I'll maybe upgrade it a wee bit. And then the other part of me is like, no, it was a 1500 pound Jaguar don't get too financially invested in it. So I'm not quite saying bangernomics, but I'm definitely going to try and be careful about not spending too much on it. I don't want to get too deep into it because as it stands at the moment, if this goes boom and it throws a really big bill, I could sell some bits off of it and get my money back. And I really like that because it just gives you that peace of mind, worry-free motoring, knowing that whatever happens, you can get out of it and get your money back. So the aim is really keep enjoying it, keep putting miles on it, look after it, but try not to spend too much money on it. And if all goes to plan in about two years, it will be celebrating 200,000 miles on the clock. So let's see if it makes it or if James has prized it out of my hands before then, because I think you're quite keen on this if you're quite honest. Actually, he's not wrong. It's not my colour, but I really, really do like that car. A year ago, I posed the question, can you really buy a top-end Jaguar? And the XJ was the top Jaguar. Okay, this wasn't the top model, but it's still flagship car, for less than the price of a service on a Ferrari. 
Well, the last time my F12 got serviced, it cost its owner just over £2,000. And this, in the 11,000 miles George has had it, has cost him, including the price of buying it, not including fuel, about two and a half thousand. So I think on balance, yeah, you really can buy, use and enjoy a Jaguar for the price of a service on a supercar. And though I am certainly just a little bit bitter that uh, George was right, I was wrong, I maintain a lot of that was luck and of course his friend's fine car hunting skills. Mostly luck actually, but I didn't have all that much to do with the buying process other than helping him go and get it. But that aside, I am far more happy at the fact that my friend has found a good, enjoyable and economical transport which has got him through winter and beyond. That really is all from the pair of us. I hope you've enjoyed today's video. And if you want to hear a little bit more from George in the future, please do drop a line in the comment section down below. If you want to get in touch with me about anything, my email address is in the description of every video. As ever, don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below and subscribe if you haven't already. We'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.